Have you ever wondered why squad leader wasn't called platoon leader? I know, this is more of a shower thought or tongue-in-cheek thought, but I've thought about it. The reason the game was originally called squad leader because you, as the player, are put in the omniscient role of the proverbial squad leader, able to control the actions of all the squads on the board. But the squad isn't a unit that can create its own sub-formation. Sure, a squad out on the battlefield can go into column mode or diamond mode or line mode, but you can't reflect that on the board. Platoons, on the other hand, can do that through the actions of the platoon leaders. Individual squads can't carry out tactics such as fire and move, overwatch, that kind of thing. But platoons can carry those things out with the aid of the platoon leader. And the platoon leader on the board is reflected by the leader counter, which is not a squad leader. You're the squad leader. So the tactics of the game are actually at the platoon level. Let's take a quick look at the tactical formations in World War II from the company level down. So this first image shows you the company, which is usually divided up into three to four platoons, three rifle platoons and potentially a weapons platoon. And then those are subdivided into squads. Let's go to the next image and see what that looks like. So US rifle platoon in World War II has its platoon leader and perhaps a platoon sergeant represented by the actual leader in the game and three squads, three rifle squads. One squad, squad A, is the fire squad, typically the fire squad. Squad B is the movement squad. And squad C is a reserve squad, which can be used for various things such as fire, movement, security, or overwatch, all of the above. It just depends on the tactical situation. And this is a level of the game where you can actually create formations and affect your play. Now, the other part of the company is a potentially US weapons platoon. And here we also have a platoon leader and or a platoon sergeant. And you have two sections. Section one is a machine gun section composed of two squads. And here, in this case, I'm showing two half squads. And a uh, mortar section composed of 13 men across three squads, or in this case, I show three crews. Typically, you won't see this actual formation unless you're playing a really big scenario. You might see fragments of this within a given scenario that's uh, mostly infantry. Now, let's take a look at uh, the formations that the platoons in World War II typically used on the battlefield and what that mo might look like on the board and then later how you can actually use that during play. Before I get started I want to mention, mention that this is U.S. platoons during World War II. These are the formations they typically used but I think it was fairly common during World War II. So the first platoon formation is the platoon column. And I show that here on a desert board. I'm using the desert board because it's wide open and it's easy to show. You have your platoon leader out front, and then you have three squads composing the platoon in line formation. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that movement on the battlefield is in real time. That's how it really happens. In the game, it's turn-based. You take turns moving individual units or potentially stacks of units around on the board. But the feel of the real-time element comes into play when you place residual firepower. So in this case, if you were marching a column down the road and there happened to be a German machine gun right there, that German machine gun in the real battlefield could fire straight down the column and inflict a lot of damage. But what's really going to happen in the game, obviously, is things are taking turns in the movement. The line machine gun is going to fire at one moving target and the rest are probably going to scatter and go into another formation or take other routes to avoid a potential residual firepower being placed in this hex. If you break the squad down to individual men, they cannot make this formation change. You can only make this formation change at the platoon level. It should be noted that within the uh, field manual FM 7.10, which at the time was a field manual for platoon or company level infantry tactics. The spacing between squads in a platoon was recommended to be uh, 150 to 200 meter, meters total. So about 50, sorry, yards. So about 50 yards between each unit. That happens to be just about the distance between hexes. So that happens to work out just right. Next platoon formation was called the platoon line. A little hard to do on this board on a hex board. Maybe it could be better reflected as a line 
like this. And that allows the platoon to react better to incoming fire, to be able, be able to spread out better and quicker. The platoon leader can either be within the uh, line or the head of the line, which I don't recommend, or somewhere behind the line, which I would recommend if you have a leader without a negative modifier. The next platoon formation is the two squad forward, one squad back, often called the V formation. It could also be shown perhaps like this. This allows a uh, formation to have firepower up front with a reserve squad in the rear to be able to react quickly. And you could have, again, the platoon leader like this, like this, like this, or again, if it's a subpar leader, you might want to have him in the back. And the next uh, U.S. platoon formation is the one squad, one squad forward, two squads back, also called the naturally inverted V formation, which might look something like this. You could have your platoon leader up front, in the rear, or even further in the rear as a rally base. And lastly, the formation called echelon left or right. What's shown here is echelon right, which looks a lot like the uh, infantry line, except it's slanted. If you went echelon left, it might look like that. And obviously that allows you to approach enemy units, whether they're favored to the left or the right of your platoon position. Leadership could be positioned anywhere within that platoon. Let's take a look at this tactical situation where we have a uh, American inverted V coming into some German resistance. Obviously this is an ideal situation. There may be other things going on uh, on the battlefield, but uh, let's zoom in on this action here. Here I have uh, the V located in J5 um, as the fire base, as the fire squad. They have a light machine gun, I believe. And then I have a potentially a move unit, squad B, and a reserve support unit as squad C. Now there are several ways you can set this up. You could you could shift it like this and have this be the fire base. And then these two be the move, since the reserve can do almost anything it wants or as needed. You could set this up to be the fire base. And this squad be as a move unit. Or you could do this, which would be similar to the second example. Or you could do this, and these could, this could be a fire group. There are various ways you could set it up. One uses an inverted V, the other uses a V formation from the perspective of this direction. So what I, what I would do is have the formation like this, primarily because of the leadership. If I had a leader of this quality, In the area, I would actually probably have him back here. I'd probably have it set up more like this. And use these as the fire group on here. And then I would use this, depending on what happened here, I'd use this as a flanking unit. And again, depending on what happened here, I would either move through like this or perhaps even bypass this hex to get even closer if I needed to or to even get potentially into here if I needed to double time. Thus using my platoon formation as a fire base with reserve and using my move unit to outflank the Germans, which was a very common tactic for US infantry during World War II. Let's say we had this situation here. Remembering that squad leader, event squad leader, is a game first, a simulation second. Um, you wouldn't just run your units up this road. You would definitely, definitely not do it in a stack. And you would definitely not do it in a line type of, or a column type of configuration like this, right? You're just going to be walking into a bunch of residual fire. So you have to make sure that you adapt your platoon tactics to the situation at hand. And the fact that residual might be laid in any one or two of these hexes um, actually causes you to move from a potentially line or column formation into a V or an echelon formation to approach uh, this, these German units. That's the adaptability. That's what you have to make 
the decisions of as not the squad leader, but the platoon leader while playing squad leader, because at its heart, squad leader is a platoon game. Keep in mind while playing squad leader as a platoon level game, they should always be thinking about things like leadership level, cover, fire bases, rally bases, and when and how to use your leadership and trying to keep the platoon bubble as close as possible. There may be scenarios where you play where you end up starting in, you know, your platoon bubbles where you have a leadership with two to four squads covering and that gets blown up. You should always try to adjust your leadership to be able to cover approximately a platoon level at any given time. And if you look at most of the scenarios, infantry level scenarios in ASL and even going back to the original squad leader system, nearly all of the scenarios are broken up into nearly platoon level type of granularity. For every leader, there's going to be two to four uh, squad equivalents, depending on the nationality. R Russians may have even higher than that. They could potentially go up to six squads uh, per leader. But in general, you're going to have two to four squads per platoon leader in every scenario. And every time I play a scenario, the first thing I do when I pick a side or get the side is I take all the units, I take the order of battle. First thing I do is I lay out all the leaders. You know, how many leaders do I have? Okay, how many squads do I have? And I start building platoons. Every, I don't care what scenario it is, this is how I do it. It's a little bit off camera. I may change it on the fly, but uh, this is how I always do it. I start building up platoons and then doing adjustments after that to make sure I've got leaderships covering every platoon in the order of battle. That's why in my head, I call this game platoon leader. I know that's probably heresy for some to hear that, but uh, it's kind of the way it is. That's kind of the way the tactics work um, with the leadership given the number of squads given, even the support weapons, the number of them giving, whether you have a uh, weapons platoon integrated into your uh, platoon or even up to company level or not. So that's all I really wanted to cover for this Friday's tactical tip to point out that uh, the game is squad leader in name only. It's an iconic game. It's squad leader from the perspective of you, the player, being able to control every squad on the board. But from its rule set and the tactics you can actually do on the board, it's actually a platoon leader. It's a platoon leader game. And think about how some of the classic World War II uh, formations that I showed you can come into play and how you can make adjustments while you're trying to achieve your tactical objective. And depending on how the uh, defender reacts to uh, how you're doing. Um, and that can be reversed too. There are ways to set up defenses um, using classical formations too, which I didn't go into. I mainly talked about this from an offensive uh, point of view. Maybe I'll do a video on that later on, but this is primarily an offensive take to classic World War II platoon formations. So that probably ran a little long than I, longer than I like. I've been trying to keep these at four or five minutes, but uh, that's the way the cookie crumbles. That's this week's tactical tip. I'll see you next Friday.